It's too well guarded. An autonomous corvette acting weird is never going to be allowed anywhere near the Valorous. That thing is their pride and joy, and almost all traffic is kept well away from it. Okay, Altius said. So do you think we're wasting our time here? There's something we could do that would make a big splash, Jinty said. There's a nightmare scenario for the entire outer system, and we can make it happen. Jinty had everybody's undivided attention now. Nave, Alti, and Jay were all staring at her, wondering what she was about to say. Look at all this, she said. Gas giants, with a large percentage of their upper atmospheres full of structures and hardware. Fleets of spaceships under construction, constantly replenishing combat losses. From huge beasts like the Valorous, down to compact little bundles of death like the Precise Strike. She motioned through the open airlock to the spaceship her maintenance pod was docked with. It's a mind-boggling concentration of power and resources. Right, said Nave, confused. Right, said Altia, nodding her head as a glimmer of an idea of what Jinty was about to say was already occurring to her. Where does it all come from, Jinty asked them. I guess the power is nuclear fusion, or antimatter, Jay said. And the raw materials are projected in from the Oort cloud by mass drivers. Right, all the metals and rare elements are projected in by railguns, Jinty said. And they use deep core power. You would only need to hack a few systems. It wouldn't take much to overload the power stations or reroute the rim projectors. And kablooey. You'd have power stations exploding, at the same time as those cargoes from the rim come raining down. It would be a hell of a mess. That sounds great, Nave said, looking from Jinty to Altia to gauge her reaction, and he saw that she wasn't convinced. Even if that's possible, Altia began. It is, Jinty assured her. That sounds like a long-term plan. Coordinating the firing of the railguns, waiting for their cargoes to arrive, and the sabotage of the power stations would have to be synchronized with that. I don't know. As Nave watched, the two women went backwards and forwards with Jinty's plan, trying to work out some way to make it feasible. Then Jay joined in, making points in support of the arguments both for and against Jinty's plan, but mostly picking holes in it. Nave's attention wandered, his eyes traveling round the interior of Jinty's maintenance pod. It was old, rusty, the grime in the corners so thick it gave the space where she kept her tools the impression that it had rounded corners. The original sharp edges of the room were so buried in a mix of suit, sealant, oil, metal shavings, and other difficult-to-identify crap. There was a small door through to the cockpit, which had also been left open. Nave smiled at the complete disregard for health and safety training this showed. He remembered a training hologram he'd been forced to sit through, with the exciting title, Always Close That Bulkhead. Through a carelessly left open bulkhead, he could see the cockpit, which was large for a cockpit, almost the size of a small bridge. It only had one chair in it, with a selection of engineering readouts and consoles, along with the usual piloting controls. The whole area was enclosed by a big glass bubble, and through that, he could make out the nearest gas giant, big enough to see with the naked eye. Suddenly, near the planet, he saw a bright flash of light. He wondered what it was for a second, then realized... It had to be the Valorous. Its new paint job must be catching the light of the far-off, one little sun. The Valorous, he said, letting the word roll round in his mouth, savoring it. He noticed the conversation that had been going on around Jinty's floating pallet, loaded up with its tools, had stopped. All three of them, Altia, Jinty, and Jay, were looking at him. He'd obviously said the word Valorous a little louder and more emphatically than he had realized. Something about the way he had said it had attracted the attention of the whole group. It was a little embarrassing to be caught saying random words, just for the pleasure of feeling them on your lips, Nave thought. But what if it wasn't just a random word? What if it was a plan? Suddenly it all fell into place and he smiled. It's the only way to make a big splash, Nave said. We steal the Valorous right from under their noses. Now it was Jinty's turn to look skeptical. I told you, she said, shaking her head. I know, I know. They won't let the Corvette anywhere near it, but we can go in on this pod, Nave said. And it's a powerful ship for sure, Jinty said, uncertainly. But could we get it away from here, without all these other ships ganging up on us and trying to blow us out of space? A very valid point, Jay said. Maybe we should have had a plan before we beamed into this hornet's nest. We have a plan, Altia said, gently reminding her two comrades and their new ally. We go down to the planet and we find... 
The Dark Heart, Nave grinned. Exactly, Altia said with a smile. We need somewhere nearby where we can land inconspicuously, Jay said. You mean actually land? Jinji grinned, incredulous. Take this Corvette planet side and set it down on one of the landing pads in the upper cloud layer? Can that be done? Altia asked. No, it cannot, Jinji said, then hesitated. But... Cirque considered herself important. She wasn't, but that's how she saw herself. After all, it was by her hard work and dedication that her repair facility, Gantry K5030, even kept going. She was the only human there, and she could see that, left to their own devices, the auto systems would order the wrong parts, fill up her storage bays, and generally cause chaos. She was needed there, to keep an eye on the automated systems. The spot laser welding rig in Bay 9, just to take one example, would just cut out sometimes. The giant mechanical crater will stop slowly crawling across the hull it was supposed to be working on, and when it did, lots of other systems, like the spider drones laying cable in hull gullies, had to stop work until the welder woke up again and carried on its crawl. She had learned what patterns of welds the machine didn't like. She had learned when it needed to slow down a little, to think where its welding arms should go so as not to crash into each other and jam the whole operation up. Of course, the Admiralty didn't care about such things. They would probably not even notice if her whole gantry blew up, which it almost had one time, during the transfer of an antimatter generator core into the starboard engine of a missile barge. Were safety procedures updated? No, they were not. What was to prevent the same thing happening again? Only her and her ceaseless dedication. It made her almost spit with rage sometimes. If she were just a little higher up the chain, there was so much she could streamline, fix, make right. A call came through as she was brooding, with one eye on a display showing a drone that was mixing paint to put a serial number across the side of a dropship in Bay 5. The little troublemaker had a penchant for choosing not quite regulation colors. She accepted the call with an imperious wave of her hand. Cirque, you there, came Genty's voice from a speaker as her hologram slowly and jerkily assembled itself. Where else would I be, Cirque said. I guess you're bringing me more problems. That's my job, Genty's hologram said. I certify these tubs unflyable, and you fix them. Have you never thought of just fixing one of them yourself, Cirque asked, genuine annoyance in her voice. You know, on sight, on the ship... Which is your job? I do, Cirque, I swear, Jinty said, her expression sheepish. Maybe some of the other grease monkeys send you stuff they could theoretically do themselves, but not me. I always give it a good faith attempt. Okay, okay, bring it down, Cirque said, as she poked a few buttons on her holographic display to assign a flight path down to the gantry. So what's wrong with it? Why can't one of the orbital repair barges deal with this? It's the computing core, Jinty said. It's doing some weird stuff. Some light acrobatics, trying to hack into the headquarters' data net, that sort of thing. Yeesh, Cirque said, calling up the ship's file and seeing that this was exactly why Genty had been sent out to it. Why in the powers is it doing that? I'm guessing a bad mission profiler, Genty said. It must think it's on an infiltration mission, but even if the mission profiler is telling it to do weird stuff, it shouldn't be acting on these urges. The bad commands should get edited out by the fuzzy logic filters. It's a mess, not to put too fine a point on it. We're going to have to rip it all out, and put in some hardware that works before its subroutines start working right again. Okay, sounds like a big job. Cirque's voice did not sound pleased. I'm going to put you in Bay 4. Shivya's hologram took a step towards Hagon's desk, so that it was standing beside him, joining him in gazing at the scale model of the Valorous he was projecting. I don't think they have the forces available to take that ship, Shivya said after a pause. They have just two fleets. Just two fleets. I don't see how they could capture the Valorous. Perhaps they don't want to steal it, Hagon said. Perhaps they believe that destroying it would be enough for whatever propaganda coup they want to achieve. Perhaps, Shivya nodded. But whatever the case, we will have to warn Admiral Tarvis that we are on our way, and that we are hunting the Drifter ship. Hagon had a well-developed sense for the power relationships within the upper layers of Terrazid military, government, and nobility. It was a convoluted, organic system of checks and balances, cozy relationships, 
power blocks, and rank that nobody in their right mind would have designed from scratch. It was always in flux. Sometimes the emperor in ascendancy, sometimes his council, sometimes the nobility, and so it went on. He'd assumed that Shivya occupied a level above any mere military personnel. She certainly far outranked him, but something in her voice told him she was either on the same rank as Admiral Tarvis, just below, or just above. It was something about the hesitation. If she easily outranked him, she would have a hologram of him in the room already, and she would be bossing him around. The same would be true if he was above her, except she would be crawling and groveling for his favor. This hesitation meant they were of a similar rank, and she was therefore hesitant of locking horns with them. Every engagement with somebody in the hierarchy, at least those on the same rank, either enhanced your status at their expense or the other way round. She sent a communication to Tarvis, a few seconds later. The Admiral's hologram joined them. He was a tall man, cadaverously thin, his face contorted by decades of sneering displeasure. Lady Shivya, he said warily, and Admiral Hagon, to what do I owe this pleasure? Lord Admiral, Shivya said, we are chasing down the drifter ship that is currently located within the Apollyon star system. Hagon was surprised that Shivya hadn't told him exactly where, even though they knew. Thanks to Zubian, they had coordinates accurate to a few feet. Here, the Admiral said, raising an eyebrow in surprise. Are you sure? The system is quite well protected. The drifter ship is a unique threat, Shivya told him. It has exceptionally good cloaking capabilities. I see, Admiral Tarvis nodded. I will begin sweeping the system immediately. A wise precaution, Shivya said. And, as I said, we are in pursuit of the drifter ship. We will arrive in system very shortly. Admiral Hagon can give you exact details. Hagon nodded and smiled, showing his willingness to give Admiral Tarvis whatever information he wanted. Very well, Admiral Tarvis replied. I will assign you an orbit at the outer boundary of the Oort Cloud, and I will deliver the Drifter's ship to you as soon as it is captured. Hagon could see from the painted expression on Shivya's face that this was the moment she had been anticipating and dreading. Tarvis was attempting to pressure her into a secondary role. If she gave in, a precedent would be set and her position would be weakened. That is not a position we have assigned for our emergence from the FTL flight, she pushed back. This fleet will arrive in a wide orbit of the sixth planet. From there, we will undertake sweeps as we deem necessary. Oh, powers, Hagon cursed silently to himself. Both Tarvis and Shivya were playing hardball. To them, their status was more important than any mission objective. You will be assigned an approved area of operations, Tarvis said, in the near proximity of the sixth planet. As I said, we will contact you when the drifter ship has been located. It was obvious that Tarvis still thought that this was a negotiation. That because he had given in and allowed Shivya and her fleet to choose their own ingress point, near the sixth planet of the system, she would now agree to let him set a limit on their search. Then they could call the whole thing a draw. But she didn't. We will join the search, and the search area will include the entire system, from primary to periphery, she told him. Good day, Admiral. She dismissed his hologram and turned to Hagon. He's not going to like that, she said. He might try to hinder your operation. Don't let him push you around. Then she was gone. Even in the upper atmosphere, the winds were strong. The precise strike wasn't a particularly streamlined design so its shields were activated, and its gravitic and maneuvering drives were working hard. Even so, it was a bumpy ride. Inside the spaceship, the dampers were working hard to smooth out all the turbulence, but you could still feel it. There was no danger of being thrown from your feet, but some of the lurches were enough to make someone stagger if they were in mid-stride. From outside the spaceship, looking up from the repair gantry as it descended, there was no sign of movement. Lurches and bumps weren't big enough to make it seem like the spaceship was the slightest bit unstable. In fact, it was a majestic sight among the clouds, which were different shades of gray and umber in the one light from the system's star, a silhouette illuminated from the powerful lights of the repair gantry below. As it inched closer and closer to the gantry, more and more detail was picked out by the bright gantry lights. Airlocks, gun turrets, maneuvering thrusters, 
These thrusters were glowing red hot with effort, and something else became apparent too. The spaceship seemed to be having trouble maintaining position. It was difficult to detect to the human eye, unless you were looking for it, but the collision warning systems of the bay that Precise Strike had been assigned to certainly noticed. They started blaring an alarm. Red flashing lights winked into life across the struts, walkways, cranes, cradles, and drone silos of the repair bay. Cirque and her control center immediately put a communication through to the spaceship. She was annoyed at the interruption rather than alarmed. What's happening over there, Genty? Cirque asked. The voice that came back sounded agitated and hesitant. It was Genty, but not the usual cocky and subordinate Genty that Cirque was used to. Um, yeah, there's a problem. It looks like the computer has forgotten how to land in a repair bay. I don't know. Maybe the docking routines have been corrupted. Strange, Cirque said. But if that's the case, you should abort the landing and do the repairs in an orbital cradle. There was a long pause and, strangely, a change in tone in the signal, as if the transmitter had been switched off for a second. Cirque didn't know why, but she guessed Jinty was swearing and didn't want it recorded. At last, her voice came back. No need to abort, Jinty said. There was definitely something strange in her voice now. I'll bring it in manually. Sir couldn't believe her ears. She stood up out of her chair and leaned towards the microphone in her console. What? She almost screamed. Are you on Lucy's? That's way too dangerous. Can you even fly one of those things? Abort! Abort! What she heard back sounded like interference. Then the line went dead. Up on the spaceship... Jinty was pulling her headset mic back out of her armpit, where she'd been scraping it around to simulate the sound of interference. Then she ditched the headset on the console in front of her. Lucy's, Altia asked, from a chair in the second rank of seating, in the corner of the spaceship's cramped bridge. She looked like she was jammed in and uncomfortable. It's a type of hallucinogenic love drug, Nave informed her over his shoulder. He was sitting in the only chair in the front rank, the pilot seat, even this was off to the side, with only a tiny monitor and a reduced set of readouts. The facilities for a human pilot were very much an afterthought. The ship was supposed to operate fully autonomously at all times. There are a lot of people doing them on the base, Jinty added, with a smile and a wink. She was sitting next to Altia in the second rank of seating. Nice, Altia said, her voice dripping with sarcasm. Hey, Jinty said as though she had only then remembered something important. Can Nave even fly a spaceship like this? He said he used to be in the infantry. Nave, Altia said, relaying the question onto the pilot. Let's just say, he shot back over his shoulder, if you want a convincing display of an incompetent landing, you've come to the right guy. Jinty and Altia shared a concerned look as the turbulence started to get worse. Jinty hadn't been wearing her security harness but she started buckling herself in now. Chapter 18 Cirque ran from the central control center to the repair bay, but she wasn't allowed to actually access the bay. The gantry security systems judged it too dangerous to allow a human to approach. It was also evacuating as many valuable drones as it could in the time remaining before impact. She watched in horror as the precise strike came into the docking bay. Too high, too fast, maneuvering drive still burning too hot, hull pitched a few too many degrees from horizontal for the capture arms to comfortably deal with. There was a tearing, grinding sound, and the decking beneath her feet shook, vibrating at the fingernails on stone frequency that put her teeth on edge. She wasn't allowed into the dock, but she could see it through an observation window and via a couple of holographic screens she had pulled up to show her different angles. She saw a docking arm being badly bent. Numerous walkways crumpled. All kinds of cradles and cranes were bent and buckled and thrown out of alignment, and one mechanical arm was ripped off entirely, to be sent tumbling down through the clouds into the freezing depths of the planet below them. The precise strike itself, apart from a few scratches to the paint covering its armor, was almost completely unharmed. Cirque stared at it in awe and dismay. The entire bay was ruined, and she found herself wondering when the Navy would get round to replacing it. There was no guarantee it was going to be any time soon. At last, 
The danger was judged to be over, but the airlock didn't let her in yet. She screamed to be given access to the docking bay. Gantry atmosphere warning, it told her. Cirque was confused. She looked back, past the rear of the spaceship, and saw that the force wall keeping the dock airtight and the poisonous atmosphere of the planet outside still looked intact. It was one of the few systems the incompetent pilot hadn't managed to slam into. The atmosphere integrity looks okay, she said. Fishers are now present in dorsal wall, the doc told her. Estimated time to repair? Twelve hours. Great, Sirk screamed. Just great. It's busted up so bad in there that I have to put on an environment suit just to go in my own docking bay? Is that it? Is that what you're telling me? Analyzing voice input, please wait, the doc told her. It's very limited intelligence teasing the meaning from her words. As soon as it thought and knew what she was talking about, it answered, Yes, that is what I'm telling you. Cirque simply screamed and went to a nearby emergency locker to get an environment suit. She started to climb into it, still growling angry words to herself. Jinti, Cirque growled to herself. I'm going to tear you anew, she was saying as her words were muffled by the helmet she was pulling down over her head. Jinti opened the precise strike's airlock to let Cirque on board, and Jay shot her as soon as she entered. His block gun was set to stun, and she was wearing a very robust environment suit, so he had to shoot her twice before she lost consciousness. She had time to say one word before hitting the floor, and it was a very bad insult indeed, curled with invective at Jinti. Maybe she would have come round, Nave said. Maybe she would have joined the rebellion, if we'd asked her. Nope, Jinti said. Trust me, not that one. Try and persuade her if you want, but definitely tie her up first. We'll talk to her later, Altia said. Are you planning to try and hack the main grid again? Nave asked. Because last time they noticed. No, Altia shook her head. I'm not going to try and hack the main system. It would be a mistake to go after the top level grid again. We'll have to stick to the local systems for now and go around it. From in here? Jay asked. Because you won't be able to wander around out here on that gantry for very long, not without being recognized. That is a problem, Altia said. You might not have to go out to get a computer core, Jinti said. I can do it for you. I'll connect up a data cable to the local computer and run it back in here. You'll get much more direct access than you ever could hiding in here. Assuming we trust you to go wandering off on your own, Jay said, his voice low but clearly audible. Which we do, Nave said harshly, aiming his words at Jay. Which we do, Altia said, a little less convinced. Which, apparently we do, Jay said, nodding with an only just perceptible movement of his robot head. Nave breathed a huge sigh of relief when Jinty came back through the airlock, unspooling a data cable behind her. Nice of you to come back, he said, smiling widely. This doesn't mean anything, Jinty told him, tutting as she did so. I could have sold you out to the Empire a hundred times while I was out there. I could have left a secret message, given a secret signal. I bet you lost sight of me a few times while I was connecting this cable up. I could have given a full report on the situation here, for all you know. Her brows were knit together. She was angry. Probably having second thoughts about whether it had been such a great idea to join the Rebellion after all. Many other people would have lost their nerve and betrayed them, Nave realized. But he was sure Jinty hadn't. But you didn't, he said, the wide grin on his face. No, I didn't, she said. After all, I made a vow. So, let's get this cable run to Altia and see if she can hack into the local computers. Altia took just a few hours to hack into the gantry computers, which were very definitely sub-AI. This time, though, she avoided confronting the main computers of the larger base structures beyond the gantry. Whenever she felt their presence in the computational shallows that she was exploring, she simply withdrew. Nave stayed with her as she worked, making comments now and again, even though she had told him to keep his mouth shut and let her concentrate. Anything juicy in the databanks you're infiltrating? Nave asked. Not so far, she mumbled. The gantry computer doesn't know much about the surrounding installations at all. From its point of view, damaged and dilapidated spaceships arrive through the clouds. The docking bay they are assigned heals them and sends them back out into the clouds. Doesn't seem to feel much curiosity about anything beyond that. Oh well, Nave said, with a disarming shrug that made her smile. 
At least we made it down to the planet's surface. I wasn't even expecting to get this far. When the headquarters computer realized you were trying to hack it, I thought that was it for us. Me too, she said. Me too. And it wasn't a good feeling. Anyway, I haven't given up. I'm going to look at the raw data in the local computers to see if they know something, without being aware of it. Patterns in the data, Nave said and nodded sagely. That's right, Altia said, a little nonplussed. Hey, Nave said. You don't have to be so surprised every time I manage to work out what you're talking about. While Altia was working at her connection with the main gantry computer, Jay and Jinty were at the airlock, securing the data cable. Cirque was tied up in a corner, still in an environment suit, but with the helmet and gloves removed. She was still unconscious. Jinty and Jay, Jinty suddenly said, attracting the robot's attention. What? Jay asked. He'd heard her, but he didn't know what to make of her saying both their names apropos of nothing. Jinty and Jay, she said. Or Jay and Jinty. Nope. Jinty and Jay sounds better. In what way sounds better? The robot asked. He liked his new human-designed voice box. He could put so much more emotion into his daily interactions. He was quite pleased with the exasperation he was injecting into his voice right then, and he hoped this stern tone would have some effect and make her get to the point a little quicker, if there was one. Jinty and Jay, she said again, face falling a little now, disappointed in him that he hadn't been able to get it. Our names together have a ring to them, don't they? It sounds like a team, doesn't it? Jinty and Jay, crime fighters or assassins. It depends on whether we decide to use our skills for good or for evil. Oh, Jay said, and then thought for a second. The idea did appeal to him somehow, but he had no idea why. I guess it does sound like a team. Maybe a couple of washed up musicians touring dive bars when the fame was all gone, and all that's left is the need to be adored by a crowd, any crowd, however small. Hey, that's great, Jinty smiled. Altia wasn't kidding when she said your brain architecture is unique. Well, Jay said, self-deprecatingly, it's not all that unique, more non-standard. Jay's words faded as he spoke them. His emotions were still raw after seeing the place he had been created after so much time. The talk of his brain architecture reminded him of the woman who had created it, who had created him. Can they really pull this off, Jinty asked, moving into an entirely different topic in one single leap. Altia and Nave, can they really just drop into an enemy hornet's nest and come out on top? Nope, Jay said emphatically, causing Jinty to give him a sudden, concerned look. But, with Jinty and Jay helping, we could take out this whole system. Jinty was nodding and grinning. I don't know how, she said, but I'm actually starting to believe it. By the way, Jay said, do you have some significant other hidden away? If so, we'll have to work out some way to get them out of here along with you. There is somebody, Jinty said, but she won't come. And I wouldn't want her along if she did. I need to move on. Jay didn't ask anything else. He knew better. Just know, he said, if you change your mind, we can pick her up. A message came through then, which made Jinty jump for a second, before she realized it was internal, from the bridge. Guys, it was Nave's voice. Get up here. Aldia thinks she's found something. I knew it, Jinty said. Me too, Jay said, but it was a lot less convincing. They all clustered round Altia, who now had a hologram projector set up on the Corvette's rudimentary bridge. Let me warn you from the start, Altia said, that this is something quite thin. Thin, Jay said. How thin? It's something suggestive in the data. A pattern of damage, Altia explained. Most of the ships coming through here are warships that have sustained battle damage and have to be rebuilt. There are also a lot of routine maintenance and upgrade jobs. So far, so normal, Nave mumbled. But there is a third, surprisingly large source of damaged ships, Altia went on. Ships listed as having sustained collision damage. Really, Jinty said. I didn't know there were so many collisions. Neither you or any of the other human engineers are ever involved in these jobs, at least very rarely, Altia told her. And the next part is the most suggestive. Yes? Nave interrupted, intrigued and unable to keep his mouth shut. The collision damage is sustained by the same fleet of ships, Altia smiled, eyes twinkling. It's a large fleet. Thirty ships? 
and the visits are infrequent and over a huge stretch of time, but there is a definite pattern. Where do the ships sustain this damage? Jay asked. That's another interesting part, Altia told him. I'm still extracting all the details. I just wanted to let you know I'm onto something, and there is a way. Altia was scanning, with her naked eye over another page of data, but her head was swaying forward with fatigue, her eyes blinking. Okay, human, Jay said. Time for bed. But I'm so close to a breakthrough, Altia said. There's something in this data. No buts, Altia, the robot told her. If you get any more tired, you're going to be a liability, not an asset. And the same goes for Nave and maybe Jinty. Maybe Jinty? In her sleep befuddled state, it seemed unfair to Altia that Jinty would get special treatment. I saw her popping some pills earlier, Jay told her. I'm guessing they're to give her energy. Oh. Altia was slightly shocked at the thought of drug taking, though she had begun to realize that both Nave and Jinty seemed to be more comfortable with it than her. But she'll pay for it later. She'll come down hard. I know, I know, Jay said. She's a big girl. It's her decision. Anyway, there'll be no pep pills for you. I've made up a bed, nice and squishy, the way your organics like it. Sure, Altia said, suddenly struck by how alluring that single word, bed, sounded to her. Great, Jay said. Nave's already in there. He's been sleeping like a baby for two hours already. Altia smiled, allowed her robot friend to lead her to a makeshift bed, deep behind enemy lines, where Nave was already curled up, snoring softly. She got in with him, nudged under his arm till they were spooning, then fell asleep herself seconds later. Ah, aren't they adorable, the robot whispered. Admiral Tarvis turned to look at the sparkling new main viewer on the bridge of his beautiful flagship, the Valorous. He had his back to the rest of the crew because he liked to foster the impression that he was a calm and emotionless strategist, and he didn't want them to see his face, which was contorted in primal rage. He gradually controlled himself, forced himself to calm down, then turned back to look at his second-in-command. How do you know this? he asked. The man's news had been terrible, but it still had to be evaluated. Direct observation, the man said. Shall I put the images on the main screen? No, Tarvis said. I need to examine them, put them through to my ready room. Tarvis stalked across the bridge, left via the main doors, and went along a short corridor to a palatial room reserved for him. A place near the bridge, but a place that was his alone. This room had a viewer too almost as big as the one on the bridge. Tarvis called up the pictures his second-in-command had sent and was about to sit at his desk to view them, but he was too agitated. Instead, he stood and stared at the screen. He saw Hagon's forces arriving, pitifully weak in comparison to his own fleet, but he had Shivia's favor, and she was providing him with all the swift destroyers that various shipyards round the Empire could build. More were joining his forces every day. And then, within minutes of arriving in the system, they were heading to a section of the asteroid belt between the rocky and gaseous planets. Within one hour, they had located the drifter ship, and they were already building a cordon around it to prevent it from jumping into hyperspace. They knew he raised his fist above his head, ready to slam into his desk, but he managed to resist the urge at the last moment. He forced a calm expression onto his long, sharp face, smoothed down his lank, blonde hair with the flat of his hand, and took a deep breath. He locked the door to his room, sat down at his desk, and activated the mini-hologram projector located there. At first, there was just static and strange blocky artifacts. Then, it cut out entirely, rebooted repeatedly, then finally made a connection. Tarvis was used to this behavior. It wasn't a fault with the viewer. It was because of the location it was trying to connect to, and the unique difficulties of data transmission. When the hologram connection was eventually established, it revealed a man on the other end of the line, who was a monster. His skin was pulled, parchment thin, over a collection of cybernetics of various vintages, some with a gleaming chrome finish that was popular a couple of hundred years before, some a dull, lifeless bronze produced in the scientist's own labs. Tarvis had known him so long that he had ceased to even notice. Tarvis, the monster said. What is it? Dr. Mordos, Tarvis whispered, though there was no chance of them being overheard. The drifter ship is here. A most dangerous gift, Mortis whispered. Tarvis was used to the man's cryptic and undecipherable mutterings. They were excusable considering how old the man was, and considering his genius. He just ignored them, and waited for him to say something that he could work with. Capture it and bring it to me, Mortis said. 
Admiral Hagan is also here with his fleet, Tarvis said. It is he who has the drifter ship, then take it away from him, Mortis said. Take it away from him? Tarvis was appalled. But Hagan is not some bandit prince I can push around. He's an admiral in the Terraza Deep Space Navy. On whose authority does he claim the drifter ship, Mortis asked. The authority of the Emperor himself, Tarvis said, his face going an even paler shade of white than it already was. And how do you notice? Mortis asked. Well, Tarvis said, his brow knitting in confusion, because everyone knew. It is well known at court that Shivia has been tasked by the Emperor with finding the drifter ship. I have my agents there, and there are people at court who... Exactly, Mortis said. You only know because of your spooks and spies. But, have you been told anything officially? Officially, Tarvis said. No. Then capture that ship and bring it to me. But Hagon has swift destru- Tarvis let his words peter out as he realized the strange old creature had cut the connection from the other side. The hologram froze, then broke up and disappeared. Kerr walked brazenly up to Admiral Hagon right there in the middle of the Admiral's own bridge. He wasn't military anymore. He was his own man, and he was no longer subject to military norms of behavior or military discipline. But his bravado started to evaporate when he got close to a real-life Admiral, in his impressively embellished slim suit of power armor. He hesitated. He shook his head at what he knew was just the remains of conditioning, training they called it, but instead of touching the man on his arm as an equal would, he deferentially cleared his throat. The Admiral half-turned, only now, seemingly aware of Kerr's presence. Admiral Hagon, Kerr said. If I remember right, I was only attached to your team until you had the drifter ship. That's correct. Well, Kerr said and gestured at the view screen that the Admiral was gazing at. There it is. What do you want, Kerr? Hagon asked, a little annoyed with the man already. Just confirmation that our arrangement is at an end so I can have my spaceship back, and the financial reward I was promised, Kerr said. Done, Hagon said. I never much liked having you around the place anyway. He nodded at a new member of bridge crew, a man in the same uniform as Shirion, with the same headgear. Go with this crew man, Hagon continued. He'll arrange everything, and then I'll never have to look at your scurvy face again. Kerr went with the Tekanoid, who led him down to the docking bay that held the Sun Chaser. Hagon watched them go. He had almost instantly forgotten Kerr, but the Tekanoid bothered him. It had begun. They were replacing key positions with these new crew members, who were absolutely impervious to the propaganda, lies, and promises of the Rebellion. Even robots and AI could go rogue, and drones were too dumb to be used to replace them completely, which left a gap. A crew member more intelligent than a drone but without the free will necessary to decide to revolt or even disobey or frustrate a single order. And here they were, Shivia's new Tekanoids. He was partly glad about it. Having his orders mindlessly obeyed was very pleasing, but something bothered him nevertheless. He did think camaraderie and teamwork were important, even if he sometimes thought they were overvalued. But with these new Tekanoids, there could be no more camaraderie or teamwork. The part of them capable of that was gone. He dismissed the thought. The Tekanoids could always be phased out again, once the current crisis was over. He turned back to marveling at the spaceship he had captured. He waited for hours, as marines in power armor were landed on the hull, Wantra and Hazak among them, and he watched as tugs were brought in to nudge the drifter ship out of the asteroid field. He was a little surprised because there was no resistance and no attempt to flee, but it was a pleasant surprise. He only glanced away when reinforcements joined him, sent by Shivia, another flotilla of swift destroyers, but soon looked back to the main view screen, captivated by what was unfolding before his eyes. In the background, he saw Zubian's escape pod being picked up by a small medical ship, but that didn't distract him for very long. By the time the drifter ship had been nudged out of the asteroid field, his specialized capture ships were in place, two giant claws ready to engulf the drifter ship so that it could be accelerated a warp field could be generated, and they could get it out of there. He was joined by Shivia, in hologram form. She was suddenly standing right beside him, shoulder to shoulder. Magnificent, she whispered into his ear. I can't wait to get my hands on it. How long before the capture ships are ready to start the journey to Seat of Reason? 
It's hard to say, Hagon said. We need to find anchor points on the surface without doing too much damage, and the capture ships are new and untested. The crews are experienced, but unfamiliar with this work. It shouldn't take more than a couple of hours, though. Beautiful, Shivia said as she watched the delicate work. Just then, an alarm started bleeding for attention. What's that? Shivia asked. It's the tactical computers, Hagan said. They've detected what they think are threatening maneuvers. It's probably a false positive. I'll take a look. He drew his eyes away from the screen and walked across to his tactical officer at her console. What's going on? He asked her. Some kind of attack? Just then, the alarm started bleeding at twice the intensity, and the blinking indicator lights turned from light amber to dark. The tactical computers were certainly upset about something. There was a hologram screen with a lot of information in front of the tactical officer, about ships in their vicinity and converging and diverging trajectories, and a lot more besides. She had plenty of data to make a judgment from. This is definitely something, she told him, her voice a whisper. Admiral Tarvis is attacking. Tarvis had been building his forces around Hagon's position for hours. Very gradually adding a capital ship here and a flotilla of corvettes there. It was gradual enough for a human observer to miss, but Hagon's targeting computers would eventually spot it. The only question was when. Tarvis and his advisors standing around the hologram table at the center of the Bridge of the Valorous, were waiting for any hint that they had been spotted. It was Sarvis himself who saw it, a subtle repositioning of the destroyers near their spider ships. It was the spider ships that were the key to the engagement. If they attached the spider ships and escaped with the drifter ship, then the day went to Hagon. If Tarvis managed to prevent that, the day went to him. He smiled at the thought. All he had to do was stop the spider ships getting away with their cargo. And the easiest way to do that was to destroy them. As soon as he was convinced that Hagon had spotted his buildup of forces, he attacked. It wasn't a random attack. It was very specifically targeted at the forces currently surrounding the drifter ship. Hagon had an entire fleet providing defense, tightly packed around the black spiders as they slowly engulfed the drifter ship. Tarvis went after them. He had carriers flood the asteroid field with drones and fighters. He had ships of the line and gunboats, and everything in between ready to go, and he committed it all. Chapter 19 The most terrible fire came from the battleships. Each battleship was designed to be able to do just one thing, and that was to project destructive force. Most of the ships in the fleet Tarvis was committing used mass drivers. It was an attack method as old as time, only different from one kid throwing a rock at another in the technology. Instead of stones, the battleship hurled long rods of heavy metal, using advanced arrangements of magnets in a long gun barrel to first accelerate the rod, then lasers were used to give an extra push to the load. The rods used by different battleships were different sizes, and the biggest ships could fire rods the size of residential buildings. Energy weapons traveled to their targets more quickly. Missiles sought out holes and defenses more surely, but the mass drivers, when they hit, were the weapons that pounded opponents into submission and defeat. Tarvis watched the characteristic jutter of the guns as they fired salvos of shots. In space, targets had a long time to dodge incoming fire, so the guns fired patterns, the turret targeting computers trying to outgress the target's evasive maneuvering computers. The guns twitched changing angle ever so slightly with each shot as they tried to cover their target with the pattern most difficult to dodge. And as the range closed, the salvos became more and more difficult to dodge. That was the normal business of battle, but this battle was different. The primary target of this battle was almost stationary. The spider ships, as they maneuvered to capture the drifter ship, were hardly moving at all. At his fleet's current range, it would be about a minute and a half before the first energy strikes started to hit home. Another half minute before the rounds from the mass drivers started to go barreling through the enemy fleet. And then, a short time later, the whole area would start to fill up with swarms of missiles, fighters, drones, and other close-in fighters, looking to establish space superiority and look for targets of opportunity. It seemed an interminable period of time to wait, but wait he had to. The ships of his fleet routinely bent and twisted the laws of physics, 
but they couldn't actually break them. Tactical computers started reporting firing from the enemy ships. Hagon hissed out a curse. The space round and among his fleet would start to fill with enemy fire in just a few minutes, with the first energy bolts arriving even earlier than that. It wasn't much time, and they had not planned for a direct attack being carried out by the local system defense fleet, but these were the moments Hagon lived for, when he had to react for a fast-changing situation. What's going on? Shivius hologram yelled, but Hagon didn't answer. It wasn't time. The mass of fire is aimed at the capture ships, right? He asked his tactical officer. Yes, Admiral, she answered, a jitter in her voice, but calm. Form the fleet up around the capture ships. They won't last ten minutes under that bombardment, so we'll have to take the damage for them. And that was it. A matter of a second or three, and the die were cast. He had decided on his strategy for the battle. He watched the giant tactical holograms around the bridge, tweaking vectors, ordering return fire as his captains attempted as quickly as possible to find a defensive globe around the capture ships. His fleet's energy shield started to flare as the first swift energy bolts came sleeting at them. Hagon knew that the splashes of light he saw weren't actually his fleet's shields, but rather the energy bolts being spread across them. But it was hard not to think of the effect as simply the shields flashing, and it was an intense light show. The ships of his fleet weren't able to maneuver much, because they had to form a tight bubble around the capture ships, so there were an unusually high number of hits from the enemy fire, but no shield penetrations. That was encouraging. He had a robust fleet, and the ships of it were piloted by battle-hardened captains who knew all the tricks. Being constrained in the maneuvering they could do meant they could pump more energy into the shields, and being packed together like fish in a barrel meant one ship's shields, at least the outer shields, could be touched against one another. This kind of merger increased the power of the shields to protect both ships. Hagon nodded in satisfaction, and turned his attention to the spotters and tactical computers accessing his own fleet's attempt to return fire. They were achieving hits, but the attacking fleet had more space to maneuver. No shield penetrations, his chief spotter told him. They're attacking us? Shivya said at last, working out what was going on. With guns. Yes, Lady Shivya, Hagon said. He had time for her now one of the heaviest bombardments this fleet has ever been subject to. We must protect our prize, Shivya said. It must be transported here to me. We are outnumbered, and the captured ships are comparatively fragile structures with comparatively weak defense shields, Hagon told her, regretfully. I'm afraid I can't make any promises. But why is this happening? Shivya's voice was more and more furious with each outburst. Don't they know we're here in the Emperor's name? Contact them and tell them that. No. Better yet, patch me through to Admiral Tarvis. Neither is possible, the communications officer said. Their systems are refusing any communications connection. What's going on here? Hagon asked, his voice cool and hard. I think they want to steal our prize, Shivia said. I think you're right, Hagon agreed. Accelerate the process, Shivia told him. Cradle the drifter ship, any old how, and hit the accelerator. Of course, Hagon said and turned back to his work, directing fire, giving orders, and making decisions. The Valorous slowly edged out of geostationary orbit around the planet. It was a speck against the massive bulk of the gas giant, but still one of the most impressive fighting ships built by humanity. It was even streamlined to some degree, with giant concave surfaces sculpting its elongated form. The ship was so big that even its gun turrets, which were massive by any measure, were made to look tiny like mere surface detail. They were mounted in a sweep to starboard and port to generate massive broadsides, and there was also a cluster on the nose, mounted on ball turrets, to fire at targets too swift and maneuverable to be caught with a broadside. The outcome of the battle at the edge of the asteroid belt was assured. Tarvis was sure of that. But it wouldn't hurt to hasten the outcome. And who knew? The mere sight of the Valorous might make Hagon tuck his tail between his legs and run. The battle was being played out for Tarvis on the holograms of his bridge, which was buried in a windowless bunker, right at the heart of the spaceship. He watched the first shield penetrations being scored against his enemy. They had gotten through the shields of a large spaceship, the NCAG. It was identified as a type of cruiser designed to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any spaceship out there, human or buzzer. It had armor to spare. They certainly wouldn't have chosen the NCAG as a target. 
It had been deliberately and sacrificially flown into harm's way to absorb fire intended for the two spiders that were even now scrabbling at the hull of the drifter ship. Tarvis watched as the tactical computer reevaluated the armor in real time. With its shields gone, the armor gauge displayed below the ANCAG was slowly declining. Tarvis smiled. The ANCAG wouldn't be in the way forever. Not at the rate it was being pounded. The ANCAG rolled to present fresh armor to the direction where most of the damage was coming from. The side of the spaceship that had just rolled out of harm's way was badly pockmarked with craters and chewed up. It was a mess of torn metal, crumbled and crunched, a blade of armor, and even some open decks. The gaping, open decks were empty of people now, but there was no guarantee they had been when the enemy weapons hit. Anyone unlucky enough to be there when their walls were blasted away would certainly have been pulled through the holes that had been torn in the side of the ship. Then, shields down and armor compromised, the ship was caught by a huge mass driver round, and it was torn in two. Both halves started gently spiraling away from each other. As the Valorous left orbit, its shadow swept over the upper clouds. Below those clouds was reputed to be a bottomless chasm. It was reputed within the Terrazid Deep Space Navy to be cursed. The Dark Heart of the Empire, they called it. It was hardly surprising, as the planet was a cold and desolate place, mysterious and gigantic. Its orbit was far from the star, leaving it a frozen ball of deadly gases. There was no solid surface. Most of the planet was ammonia, methane, and water ices, mostly blue, but also shot through with red. Methane in the atmosphere chemically changed to carbon, and under the planet's extreme pressures, this carbon often became diamond. Storms of shimmering diamonds, raining down on the inhospitable, slushy surface below the cloud. After leaving orbit, the Valorous made its way through the collection of small and irregularly shaped moons orbiting the planet, like threatening ice sculptures. The planet also had a couple of handfuls of rings, made up of boulder-sized clumps of rock. The Sun Chaser cleared the bay doors of Hagon's flagship, and Kerr breathed a little sigh of relief. I sure am glad to be getting out of there, right, Chaser? he said. It was a very profitable arrangement, Kerr, the ship's computer said. But it was not a good fit for your skill set, or personality. I don't think being part of Admiral Hagon's fleet would have worked out in the long term. Kerr smiled. Never a truer word, he thought to himself. The flagship he was powering away from was at the heart of the fleet, so he would have to weave his way through various outer rings of battleships, corvettes, destroyers, and gunboats before he would be able to get a clear enough run to jump into hyperspace. He eased off the acceleration and started cruising through the formation of mighty fighting ships. There's something strange going on out there, Chaser said. What? Kerr asked. But then he saw it. The way the ships at the outer edges of the fleet were tightening up looked defensive. And then, he saw a destroyer start to maneuver hard. The huge ship was twisting on its axis, climbing and reversing in a way that made it abundantly clear it didn't want to be in the area of space it had just been happily sitting in a moment ago. There could only be one reason for that. Somebody had taken a pot shot at it. And sure enough, its shield started to sparkle with incoming fire. A lot of incoming fire, from big guns. Buzzers? Kerr asked. It was the only explanation that made any sense. Who would be able to take on the local system defense fleet and Admiral Hagon's fleet at the same time? It was a huge concentration of power, and only a mighty buzzer swarm could even think about attempting it. There was no way some border world prince would dare. It had to be a buzzer swarm. Maybe two. By the powers, Kerr cursed. If the Navy starts slugging it out with a buzzer swarm, the last place we want to be is in the middle of it. Agreed, Chaser said. And if she hadn't been sub-AI, and theoretically incapable of real emotion, he would have sworn he had heard some fear in her voice. The question is, Kerr mumbled, how do we escape the battle? Do we make the jump to faster than light travel, or do we find a place to set down? The buzzers are most probably here because of the drifter ship, which means ship-to-ship combat will be ongoing in this area. However, once they either snatch the drifter ship or are beaten off, they are unlikely to want to stay and invade such a militarized and well-defended system, Chaser said. The planetary services should be quite safe. We can wait there until the battle has run its course. 
Sounds good, Kerr growled. Let's find somewhere to hide. He flew towards the nearest gas giant, making a wide detour to avoid the Valorous. In a battle group, there was information rounded, who were coming the other way. Magnificent sight, the Valorous. It must be going to reinforce the main body of ships, Kerr said. The buzzers won't know what's hit them. Indeed, Chaser said. Though, my tactical systems are having trouble understanding what is going on. It's almost like the Imperial ships are fighting at each other. Perhaps the enemy are cloaked. My scanners haven't picked up any buzzers yet. That's a good thing. Trust me, Kerr told the computer. Let's get clearance to land somewhere, or at least get permission for a low orbit. I'm contacting local authorities, Chaser said. There was a delay while the ship's computers started trying to find them a place to wait out the battle. Kerr used the time to watch the Valorous. It couldn't be seen with the naked eye, but he was still getting a good view on one of his long-range viewing screens. He was looking at the rear now, a cluster of engines surrounded by as much armor as possible, forming a cocoon round them, with the bright lights of the engines visible within. Magnificent beast, isn't it? Kerr murmured. The ship's computer didn't answer. It was busy trying to get landing permission, and it decided after running some complex analysis that the question was actually more likely to be rhetorical. It's heading right for Hagon. Must be going to reinforce him, Kerr said. He could clearly see the huge turrets on the flanks of the dreadnought. They were twitching and juddering, and there were bright flashes from the laser light used to accelerate the mass driver rounds from its main guns. Wow, Kerr said. I wouldn't like to be on the receiving end of that barrage. I have permission to land, Chaser told him. About time, Kerr said. A little distracted. What was the holdup? It's difficult to say, Chaser told him. None of the local space traffic control systems or autonomous bases was accepting anything more than a comms handshake from us. Oh, Kurt said. Why? Because we aren't with Hagon anymore? That's just it. We were still listed on their systems as being part of Hagon's fleet. It was precisely because we were with Hagon that they weren't talking. Huh? Kerr was quickly trying to work through the implications of this new piece of information. But you got us permission to land in the end. Yes, Chaser told him, almost proudly. I didn't give up. And I found a repair gantry that assigned us a docking bay. But we don't need repairs, Kerr said. By the time they work that out, the battle will be over, Chaser said. It'll piss them off, Kerr mused. But we don't have much choice. I'll take us down. I wonder why that facility decided to help us. Not sure, Chaser said. In fact, their communications protocol were a little off. Like, maybe there's some damage to it, or it's been hacked. I don't like the sound of that, Kerr groaned, but he didn't change direction. It was either that, or stick around and wait for the battle to hot up. He pointed the nose of the Sun Chaser at the planet and headed for the coordinates the ship's computer gave him for the repair gantry that had agreed to take them. It's strange, Chaser said as they descended. I still can't see any buzzers. And I would swear the Navy ships are firing at each other. Altia was swimming in an endless ocean. The water was dark, like red wine, and the sky above was amber. Except that she somehow knew it wasn't a sky. It was the underside of something. Something huge. And dangling from that sky were long, spindly stalks. At least that's what they looked like when she lay on her back in the water, sculling with her hands and feet to keep afloat. If she followed one of them down to the surface of the water, with her eyes, she soon realized that each one was actually a mighty tower, bigger and taller than any human skyscraper, and supremely enigmatic. The towers didn't stop at the surface of the water. They carried on down into the depths below, and if they had foundations, they were lost in the swaying shadows of the undersea world. She was alone, and this wasn't the first time she'd been here. It was like a dream that wasn't a dream. A dream was some ineffable component of reality. She knew she was bone-tired, in a makeshift bed on an enemy warship, Nave's muscular arm thrown over her shoulder. But she also knew she was awake and alert. And here. Wherever here was. She was wearing some kind of swimsuit. Not much different to her usual clothes, except a little more form-fitting, to make swimming easier. It was an outfit she was certain didn't exist in the waking world, and yet it felt real. Altia had visited this place so often now that she knew how things worked, or at least, 
She was starting to think she might have an inkling of how these things should work. She dove below the surface, into the dark of the water, but she could see. It was like she had captured some of the amber luminescence of the ceiling of this place in her eyes, and it wouldn't leave her eyes again until she came back up. Algia tried to stay fit, but she had never been an athlete, even less a swimmer, so she never developed the facility to hold her breath for long periods of time. She still didn't think she would be able to hold her breath long in the waking world, but she had been developing her capacity, here in the Sea of Memories. She could swim underwater for 20 minutes here now, without taking a breath. The light she captured in her eyes lit her way, like two flashlight beams, sweeping out in front of her. The sea was wide and deep, and other creatures swam in it. She'd seen ample evidence of that. And, from what she had seen so far, none of them were human. She saw them sometimes, always at a distance, and always huge. None of the other creatures were even on the same scale as her. She was terrified of them, but at the same time she wasn't frightened. She wasn't sure they were aware of her. She had decided she was most likely beneath their notice. She dove meter after meter, down and down, and the air started to hurt in her lungs. Her ears started to feel sharply painful as the pressure built. Down she went, further and further, till she saw a sunken edifice, like a city perhaps, or a ruined temple. She'd seen it before, she was sure perhaps in another visit. She was sorely tempted to take a look, but she decided her situation in the waking world was too precarious, and it was time to turn back and head for the surface. For a moment it seemed impossibly far above her, and she felt some presence below her, something sinister she was sure she hadn't seen before. She kicked her legs, powering upwards, and the distance that had seemed so unsurmountable before started to shrink. It still seemed too far, but she held on. She burst through the surface in an explosion of spray and gasped at the air with her mouth open. As she did so, a drop of spray landed on her lip and trickled into her mouth. Just for a moment, she got a hint of being somewhere else again. She felt she was standing on an endless metal plane, but the metal was bronze. She had something in her hand, though it wasn't a hand, more a claw. She thought perhaps she knew where she was. She was one of the very few left and she was on the surface of an artificial planet. Just like the one she had been studying so long ago when she got dragged into all this craziness. And then the vision faded. She swam to one of the towers, a long swim, seemingly of several hours, and she put her hand against its uneven surface. A shock like static jolted her fully awake. Nave was still asleep, still in the same position with his arm around her shoulders, but she knew she couldn't sleep any longer. She had work to do. She disentangled herself from him, kissed him on the forehead and went back to the bridge. She went straight back to analyzing the data set she had already started with, and after her dream, it made a lot more sense. She'd been asleep seven hours and she felt refreshed. And at last, she saw a shape to the data. The ships she had found, the ones who were only damaged by physical blows, shearing forces and slicing cuts, suddenly made sense. Altia pulled up a holographic window full of data, then another and another. There, she hissed, then raised her voice to yell. Hey, Knave, I found it. I found what I was looking for. The others came hurrying to the bridge, all three of them. What have you found? Jay asked. Look at these trajectories, she said. These in the window on the left are the arrival and departure trajectories of the fleet, with the strange damage profiles, and this other window is for the normal ships they repair here. Okay, Nave said, his voice trailing off as he concentrated, trying to see what she was seeing. They're flatter, Jinty said. All of them. Flatter than the norm. Look at this one, Altia said, pointing at a few lines of data, isolated and highlighted, on one of the screens. The local traffic control computers of the gantry hand their spaceships off pretty quickly after they leave. But look, before this spaceship gets handed away to the main traffic control system, it's already dipping. Dipping, Jay said, a little confused. Why? Because, Altia said, that fleet isn't based out there. She pointed above her head. It's based down there. She pointed at her feet. I don't understand, Jay said. 
There's a base down there, Nave said, suddenly intuiting what Altia was saying. There is a base down there, Altia confirmed with a smile. That doesn't make a lot of sense, Jinty said. I mean, boating in the atmosphere of a gas giant is hard enough, even if you pick a good cloud layer. If you go too deep, you're just making extra problems for yourself. This gantry is one of the deeper structures. Build anything lower than this, and you start to have to harden the structure against the pressure. Thicker walls, to put it bluntly, cost more money, and the Navy isn't fond of spending extra money if they don't have to. So there must be a good reason this base is down there, Nave said. 